Well, bless my soul, but what's wrong with me? I'm itching like a man on a fuzzy tree. My friends say I'm acting wild as a bug. I'm in love. I'm all shook up. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever had one of those days where everything just seemed to not go like it's supposed to? Guess what? Today is one of those days. Uh, I don't have my microphone. The door's locked and I can't get to the office. The charger for my pad uh, won't work. And so we may run out of pad before I reach the end of the sermon. But we are here in the house of the God this morning and we are here to worship. We are here to give him our praise, regardless of our circumstances, regardless of what is happening in our lives. Let us give praise to Almighty God as we join together in our call to worship. As Jesus came into Jerusalem that day long ago riding a donkey, the people whispered, What's his name? Who is he? The crowd shouted back, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But who is he? His, his disciples praised God joyfully for all his mighty deeds of power. They, they shouted, Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. But do we know him by his name? Hosanna to the Son of David. Jesus is his name. Let us pray. Most gracious God, we give our thanks to you this morning for this extravagant gift of your love that you've given to us in your Son. With those crowds so long ago, let us shout out all of our hosannas. Let us wave our palm branches high, proclaiming Christ as the King of our lives. And as we worship this morning, grant us the courage to follow you even to Jerusalem. And as we travel, let us be mindful of the times when silence speaks volumes of caring and when words echo the compassion of your love. Help us to speak when the easiest way before us is to keep silent. Let our words sustain, nurture, comfort, and stir the complacent as we remember that you came and turned the world upside down and then put everything right. We offer our prayers in the name of the one whose cross we carry, Jesus the Christ. Amen. When I think about the road Traveled by my Savior's feet When I think about the cross He bore The pain and suffering And knowing where the path would lead He willingly obeyed He could have called 10,000 angels To carry Him away Thank you. 
in our culture, we tend to use words in, in funny ways. In fact, sometimes words um, become more of a way of masking truth than an actual indicator of truth itself. A uh, prime example of that is in advertising. When you go to the grocery store, you will see on the labels of the products that you buy all different kinds of claims. One of those is fresh. You see that? Fresh. Now, to me, fresh means somebody just walked outside and picked it off a bush. But now, legally, technically, the word fresh only means that it has never been handled at a temperature lower than 26 degrees. So it could have been sitting on that shelf as long as a Twinkie, you know, and, and still be called fresh. It can have hair growing on it. Uh, but as long as it's never been below 26 degrees, you can call it fresh. Natural, that's another one of those terms that we use. Now to me, natural means, well, well, natural, right? Again, you could walk outside and pick it off a bush or pluck it off a tree, but uh, technically, in, in, in government speak, natural doesn't mean that. It just means that it doesn't contain anything artificial. Now, that's a big ballpark, because you can have a hot dog with about 30% ground-up newspaper, and since cellulose is natural, it could be advertised as an all-natural product, Okay. Things like Velveeta, uh, cheese, cheese Whiz, ain't no cheese in them. That's why they call them cheese food. Bacon bits, never saw a piece of bacon in its life. Maple syrup, as close as that maple syrup ever got to being maple syrup was you can see a maple tree from the window. That's about the size of it. You see, we use words in funny ways, and we use them usually to mask rather than tell the truth. And yet when we come to this point in the service, when we seek to uh, be in an attitude of prayer, confess our sins, there's a certain honesty that is required of that. We have to be honest with God. We have to be honest with ourselves. We have to recognize who God is, and we have to recognize who we are without pulling any punches, without trying to make ourselves look better than we really are, to honestly confess our sins. Because we're told that if we but confess our sins, He is just and righteous to forgive us. So let us now go before God Almighty and confess our sins before Him and before each other. God who visits us in human form, we confess our impossible expectations of other humans. In our need for perfection, we make idols of those who are merely mortal. Seduced by power, glamour, or ability, we hope for superhumans. Disappointed by our heroes' imperfections, we set them up for failure. Seeking to forget our own imperfections, we forget that we are our own sources of disappointment. As we confess our need to scapegoat, forgive our deficiencies. As we live according to your mercy, strengthen us to look with mercy on the faults of others. And may we learn to see all your people as your chosen children, brothers and sisters, gifted by grace, potential visitors from you. My children, God visits us not in order to condemn, but to forgive. And God frees us not so that we can condemn other people, but so that we can forgive them according to the grace that we have received ourselves. So be at peace and know that in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. God of great love, we confess that we very often fail to remember that no matter where we are, that we are surrounded by your love. We find ourselves kind of zipping and zinging through the busyness of our days. We're uh, our schedules imprison us rather than setting us free. We're in the throes of despair or in the midst of a stormy time, and we forget that no matter where we are, no matter what we experience, that's where you are too. So in these moments of quiet, let us be still and know that you're God. In the certainty of your love, we pray this morning for those who are ill, for those who care for them. We pray for those who serve in distant lands, working and serving in harm's way. We pray for those who work for peace, those who bring help to those who are in need. And we pray for those this morning whose burdens we share. 
Lord, grant us the courage to give into your hands all those burdens that we carry, all the resentments within us, the anger, the fear. Take away all those things that rob us of you and in the void that's left behind, fill it with your peace. Free us from all the things that bind us in the name of the one that taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. going to be full. It's always full. On Easter, it's always full. And it'll be the same in your church, I promise. It'll be full. It'll be full of people like me, full of people who haven't been to church in a while, full of people who think they might be critiqued or analyzed or judged unfairly, full of people who don't have God in their lives and aren't exactly sure how to get him back. But you know what, before I step in, I need you. I need you to do something that's probably a big deal for you. You're going to see me this week, and I need you not to walk past me, and I need you to work through your fear because I'm working through mine, and I just just need you to invite me in. And if I act like I'm not interested in going to church with you, still, I need you to ask me to come. I need you to help me see God. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. I need you more than you know. Because look, at the end of the day, God said he loved me enough to die for me. I mean, that is the claim, right? And if he died and he didn't stay dead, your church is going to be full this Easter. Your church could be full this Easter of people just like me. Different face, different skin color, different age, sex, or social status. But make no mistake, I could be sitting right next to you just need you to invite me in, that's all. Nothing more, nothing less, and nothing complicated, and nothing driven by guilt. Just invite me in. I need you to. Our journey through the scriptures this Palm Sunday begins with the text from Isaiah chapter 50 verses 4 through 9. The Master God has given me a well-taught tongue so I know how to encourage tired people. He wakes me up in the morning, wakes me up, opens my ears to listen as one who is ready to take orders. The Master God opened my ears and I did not go back to sleep, didn't pull the covers back over my head. I followed orders, stood there and took it while they beat me, held steady while they pulled at my beard, didn't dodge their insults, faced them as they spit in my face. And the Master God stays right there and helps me, so I'm not disgraced. 
Therefore, I set my face like flint, confident that I'll never regret this. My champion is right here, so let us take our stand together. Who dares bring suit against me? Let him try. Look, the master God is right here. Who would dare call me guilty? Our second text is from the epistle to the Philippians, chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. You see, he had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what, not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave. He became human, and having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privilege. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and died a selfless, obedient death, and the worst kind of death there is, a crucifixion. Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far beyond anyone or anything ever, so that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long ago dead and buried, will bow and worship before this Jesus Christ and call out in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me mm. So kind to me And oh, the overwhelming Never-ending, reckless love of God And oh, it chases me down Fights till I'm found Leaves the ninety-nine And I couldn't earn it And I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God
No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No, 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 no shadow you you won't climb up coming after me no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me no 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 shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me yeah no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down Coming after me, oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. And oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99, and I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Let us pray. Eternal God, we lay aside this morning all those things that distract us, all of those things that burden us down so that we can, we can hear that still small voice of yours speak to us words of truth and grace. May you be all that we seek or desire. We ask that you meet us in those places of our greatest brokenness and need. For the sake of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The text for the message is from the 19th chapter of Luke, verses 28 through 40. Now, after saying all these things, Jesus headed straight up to Jerusalem. And when he got near Bethphage and Bethany at the mountain called Olives, he sent off two of the disciples with these instructions. Go to the village across from me, and as soon as you get there, you'll find a coat tethered, one that's never been ridden untied and bring it and if anybody asks anything like what are you doing you say well the master needs it so the two left and they found it just like he said and as they were untying the coat its owner said what are you what are you doing untying that coat and they said well the master needs it and they brought the coat to jesus and then throwing their coats on his back they helped jesus to get on and as he rode the people gave him a grand welcome throwing their coats in the street Right at the crest, where Mount Olives begins its descent, the whole crowd of disciples burst into enthusiastic praise over all the mighty works that they had witnessed. Blessed is he who comes, the King in God's name, all's well in heaven, glory in the high places. But some Pharisees there in the crowd said to him, Teacher, you need to get a grip on your disciples. But he said, Even if they keep quiet, The stones themselves would do it, shouting praise. The word of God for the people of God. To a lot of younger folks today, what I'm going to say probably places me back in the age, you know, when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Uh, But I can remember when we didn't have a television set. The only thing we had was radio. And uh, we we listened to the radio just about all the time. And uh, growing up, I I got a pretty healthy uh, pretty healthy dose of Elvis Presley. Elvis was the big deal uh, back in the fifties, and that was about all we listened to as far as pop music was concerned. And one of my favorite songs that that Elvis Presley always sung was "All Shook Up." 
Remember that one? You like that one? A good one. It was a good one. You know, reached top of the Billboard's magazine charts in 1957 and stayed there for eight weeks. Elvis, if you're not familiar with Elvis, he kind of hit the he hit the American music scene like a like a ton of bricks. Nobody had ever seen anything or or really heard anything like Elvis Presley before. And a lot of folks they dubbed him as the king of rock and roll or just called him the king. And a lot of folks, well, and a lot of folks worship Elvis. You know, compared him to Jesus. You know, and they they made. Uh, they made uh, obvious some of these some of these comparisons between the two. For instance, Jesus told his cr- told the crowds to love their neighbor. Elvis saying, "Don't be cruel." See, Jesus is is part of the Trinity. You know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, the first band that Elvis was ever in was a trio. Jesus walked on water. Elvis served. Jesus was the Lamb of God. Elvis had mutton. Uh, mutton chop sideburns and Jesus is alive and Elvis is well he's not this passage that we have from Luke this morning uh, talking to us about Palm Sunday and this procession of the king well it leaves us a picture of an entry into Jerusalem that leaves the entire city all shook up well why not I mean Jesus had just finished telling his disciples the story about that greedy and vengeful king. You know, it's a pretty shocking story. It ends with the monarch telling his his servants, he says, as for these enemies of mine who didn't want me to be the king over them, then bring them here and slaughter them in my presence. Harsh stuff. Slaughter them all. Kill them all. Let God sort them out. It's kind kind of the modus operandi of a lot of the ancient kings in the area. And so the followers of Jesus began to wonder just exactly what it is this ruler, this new ruler, is going to bring, you see, to the enemies of Israel. Jesus, always knowing what's in the heart of his disciples, uh, tells this story because they supposed, you see, that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately, and the messianic hope was, of course, that uh, apart from making sure everybody had a Cadillac in every garage and a chicken in every pot, that the Romans were going to be severely tromped and sent packing out of the land of Israel. But at this particular moment in time, it's really kind of hard to predict just exactly what Jesus is going to do. Is it going to be salvation or slaughter? Is it going to be reconciliation or revenge? Peace or a sword? You see, the disciples are kind of they're feeling the anxiety uh, that, that Elvis captured so well in that, that, that song of his, Oh, bless my soul, what's wrong with me? I'm itching like a man on a fuzzy tree. Now, can't you just picture that? That's a lot of movement, you know? Disciples itching like a man on a fuzzy tree. They're nervous wrecks. They don't know exactly what Jesus is going to do as he gets nearer and nearer to Jerusalem. There were some uh, hope that he's going to drive the Romans out and rescue the Jews from all their oppression. Others hope he's going to come in and, and replace King Herod and himself become God's king, the Messiah. Either one of those scenarios, you, you, somebody's head's going to roll. But as he gets closer to Jerusalem, it it begins to appear that Jesus has another agenda altogether. From the Mount of Olives, the disciples disciples, uh, go into the village ahead. Jesus sends them, and he tells them exactly what they're going to find. There's going to be a colt there, one that's never been ridden. I want you to bring it here. If anybody says anything to you about it, just tell them the master needs it. Now, Jesus never did anything by accident. Now, a lot of folks would like us to think that Jesus got caught up in just the, the whole uh, romance of what was going on in his life and is, is an innocent victim in all of this. But a lot of what Jesus did was, was, was well planned, and this was one of those issues. You see, he intentionally picks the colt because of this prophecy that comes to us from Zechariah. Lo, your king comes to you on a colt, the foal of a donkey, 
And you see this, this choice of a donkey also sends the message that Jesus is the bringer of peace instead of violence. If he had wanted to take down the Romans, he most certainly would have chosen another means of transportation, like maybe a, like maybe a stallion. But it appears that this king is a lot more interested in reconciliation than in getting revenge. Another message that Jesus sends in this triumphal entry is that this entrance is not human, it's divine. When the disciples go into that village, Looking for that coat, they find everything arranged just exactly as Jesus said, supernaturally scripted, perfectly prepared. And when the, when the owners uh, of the donkey began to ask, why are you untying the coat? Jesus, the disciples reply, well, the Lord needs it. And it's like they get a free pass. Uh, that very simple answer kind of seals the deal. And as Jesus rides along, people very spontaneously are kind of spreading their coats in the road. And that is an indication of the awe in which they hold Jesus. They are, they are claiming this, this new, this new uh, teacher as a Messiah. I'm in love, they seem to be saying. I'm all shook up. Now at the same time, the whole multitude of disciples grasp the divine dimension of the moment and they begin to praise God for all the deeds of power that they have witnessed. And so what started out as just kind of a, an innocent parade for a king ends up in this extraordinary procession for a Messiah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven. Glory in the highest heaven. You can almost hear the echo, you see, of those angels on that first Christmas morning so long ago as they welcomed that baby born in Bethlehem. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those whom he favors. Clearly, clearly this Messiah is a lot more focused on salvation than he is on slaughter. Of course, we all know the story. Not everything in the city of Jerusalem is peaceful. The Pharisees, well, boy, they really shook up, say. Right along with some of the other uh, more important people of the day, as they're watching all these folks spread their cloaks in the road and uh, making all the acclaim for Jesus, they're, they're, telling, they're kind of siding up to Jesus and going, you really need to get a grip on these disciples of yours. Their rhetoric is getting out of control. It's hate speech. You need to stop. And Jesus aware that this kingship of his is not of human origin. It is beyond any human control whatsoever. He says, look, even if I, even if I could convince them to be quiet, the very cobbles in the road would begin to shout. You see, his kingship is divine. And that God will assemble a chorus of whatever needs to be in order to give a claim to this king, even if he has to use stones and streets. So Jesus enters into the city of Jerusalem and, and, and boy, does he shake things up. Those shock waves start out the moment he rides that donkey through the gate and, and then he, he proceeds to weep over the city and the way that city has always treated its prophets and holy men. He marches into the temple and with a, with a whip, he, he turns over the tables of the money changers, drives all of them out of the temple. My house, you've turned into a den of thieves. It is supposed to be a house of prayer. And then he denounces the scribes and the Pharisees, calls them, uh, calls them vulture, predicts that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. Evidently, Jesus never read how to win friends and influence people. So all this chaos increases day by day, almost hour by hour, until finally Jesus is arrested, he's sentenced, he's killed on a cross. And we all know what's coming next. I mean, the shakiness and weakness that we feel on a, on a day like today, on Palm Sunday, intensifies as we, as we move through the events of the rest of Holy Week. You see, the problem with palm branches is that once you cut them off a tree, they don't live long. And the problem with Palm Sunday is that the excitement of the crowd that's 
just very soon fades away. And when Good Friday finally comes around, a lot of those voices that were shouting Hosanna at the first of the week, where they're, they're some of the same voices that are shouting crucify him. So what is the full impact of this day? What does it mean for us in the 21st century to be followers of Jesus Christ on Palm Sunday? Well, I think Elvis might have been on something. He said, I'm all in love and I'm all shook up. You see, when we follow the king, we are doing that out of a sense of love. We are not doing it because we feel obligated to, not even that we have a duty to do it, It is entirely voluntary, this connection that we have with Jesus, and we follow him because we find ourselves intensely attracted to this message and to this mission. We are deeply drawn to the salvation that he's bringing to all of humanity, the reconciliation, the peace that he promises. Jesus is not that that greedy and vengeful king that he told the story about. Instead, he is a very generous, very merciful, very loving, very forgiving Messiah who enters Jerusalem and sacrifices his life for each and every one of us. This this uncontroversial, unconventional king says, love thy neighbor. Elvis said, don't be cruel. It's a message that grabs us, inspires our allegiance. At the same time, Following Jesus as the Messiah, truly following him as the Messiah, means that we are literally going to be all shook up. Whether you've noticed or not, as Christians, if we are true to the calling and true to the name, you're going to find yourself out of sync with this world. Because this world is ruled by the all too comfortable forces of aggression and revenge. Whoever lives by the sword dies by the sword. Jesus entered Jerusalem as a prophet, and he saw that the real troublemakers were not the ignorant, they weren't the cruel, it was the corrupt. Jesus knew that love your enemies didn't mean that you weren't going to make any. Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those that abuse you. This approach to life does not necessarily fit with that very highly competitive and conflict-driven world that we live in. And it doesn't make any difference what world you live in, whether it's one of uh, business or politics or education or the military or even the church. Follow Jesus and you can find yourself feeling as out of place as an Elvis impersonator at a Madonna concert. But now there's a huge benefit following Jesus, especially if you don't mind being all shook up. When we walk behind Jesus, we become a lot more clear about where we stand as Christians. Will Willimon tells a story about uh, one of the general conferences he attended. Uh, I've never attended a general conference myself. Um, I have watched the live feed at several uh, general conferences, and it's one of those things where you, you uh, remember the old saying about watching sausage being made? Well, that's kind of what the general conference is like. It's, it's, uh, you want to hear about the results. You don't necessarily want to see exactly what's going on. But he, uh, Will is having a discussion with, uh, with one of the delegates over uh, some of the very controversial issues that have been taken up. One of those has to do with gun control, whether or not United Methodists or have handguns. And it's kind of like uh, somebody asked John Wesley one time if Methodists could dance. And he said, well, some can, some can't. <laughs> so during one of the coffee breaks, uh, Williman is, is talking with this fellow delegate. And he asked how he voted on the regulation. And the man said, well, he said, I voted in support of the ban against handguns. And Williman said, well, how in the world did you decide to do that? And he said, well, Jesus. Jesus? He said, yeah. He said, you know, sometimes, sometimes I really wish 
that when those soldiers came to arrest Jesus that night in the garden uh, and, and on the Mount of Olives, that, that he had pulled out a gun and defended himself, or at, at the very least he had let the disciples uh, defend him with their swords, but he didn't. And see, that's kind of how we as Christians are stuck with Jesus. To be a Christian is to be about Jesus. To be a Christian is to mean, is meaning to listen to Jesus. Judge ourselves by Him. Ask for the grace to see Him more clearly. Follow Him more nearly. Love Him more dearly. Day by day by day. Jesus comes to us as a king. And He gives us clarity as to what it means to be a Christian. I think sometimes we make Christianity out to be a lot more difficult than it is. Uh, if you really want to know what Jesus feels like about a certain issue, just read the Bible. If you want to know how you're supposed, how you should behave. All you have to do is just watch his actions. Watch how he behaves. You see, he loves us. He invites us to join him, to imitate him. Challenges us to focus our lives and our attention on salvation, on reconciliation, on peace. And what happens is we discover a life that is truly, truly worth living. Even if it does make us feel all shook up. Let us pray. Uh, loving and caring God in the darkness of our sin and confusion, we seek to renew the faith that we have in you. In the face of death and suffering, we long to hope and the promise that you grant us of eternal life. In times of loneliness and alienation, we desire the consolation of your love. When you speak of faith, you tell us that uh, really all we need is just a little bit, and with a little bit we can do a lot. So deepen our faith. Help us to live trusting that you're with us every single step of the way. We know that our faith sometimes is going to shake and falter. But continue to strengthen us. Let us see that in every moment you are ever faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. The journey of Jesus took him into a world of suffering and rejection and death. As you go from this place into that very same world, be emboldened and empowered to take up your cross and to follow Jesus. Remember that every single one of you are reflections of the life and the teachings of Jesus Christ, his love and his grace. So live out the gospel in every encounter you have. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.